Hello. So, it's December the 1st again, so before I begin, once again, time has fallen at the feet of my ass to teach y'all how to be a man. Let me tell y'all, y'all don't just be a man, y'all do. Just don't do it all. Nobody in this room invented patriarchy, and nobody in this room invented white supremacy, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> but we're subject to it, and we're, well, you know, we're swimming in it. Wow. See, I went to, to uh, I did go to the Being a Man Festival. I've got all the wristbands this Friday, this Saturday, this Sunday. Yes, I have showered since then. They're very durable. I've got all I've got all the programs for all three days. I've got all the information here. And golly, gosh, for the gizzard of me, Jude, I can't find the talk or the seminar or the workshop that explains or <laughs> even expands on what you just said. There's a lot of rappers dissing their dads and a lot of rich, effeminate hipsters dissing their dads. But dash it all, dude, I just plum can't find the talk on what patriarchy is, how we've determined the extent of its effects, and how we've determined that everyone, without exception, is swimming in it. Could you key us in on how the fluid mechanics are calculated in this particular hydrodynamic system? So this is a festival about men. I think a really important question to perhaps ask at a festival about men would be patriarchy. Is it a thing? How helpful is this theory? Like, are we married to it? How much wiggle room do we have here? But, but as you can see, that's out of the question because the founder of the festival herself considers it an open and shut case. She elementally compared patriarchy with the air we breathe. It is everything, it is everywhere, and we say so. Page one, we all live in a system which benefits men at the expense of women. Now turn to page two and let us never speak of page one again. Tear out, tear it out of the book and make a nest out of it if you can. This is, or I mean any analogy would be a stretch, but it's, it's a little bit like going you know, to an atheist convention and seeing the founder and artistic director of the entire event openly saying to the audience, we all know there is a God, and we all know who his messenger is, and we're here to show how much we love the infidels. I'm sure you would know and say that as a feminist, my main point in founding being a man was to acknowledge that we love men. We have men who are fathers to us, we have men who are brothers to us, we have men who are sons to us, we have men who are lovers to us, we love men. What about the men you'll never meet, dude? What about the men over there who don't pay the taxes you want and don't vote the way you want? What about those other men who aren't legally or socially bound to protect you at their own expense? Like the men on the TV and the villains in your storybooks. They're the men you walk past every day and never have to think about. You don't care about those men, dude. You're not allowed to. Because those men are the patriarchs. Southback Centre, it's the Royal Festival Hall, that's the eye, so you know where we are. Uh, Asher D just finished his talk, he's, he's, he's a rapper, my favourite part was when someone in the audience asked him, how do you share your love equally between your seven children? And he was like, oh I don't, I have a favourite. <laughs> it's the one with ADD and autism. <laughs> oh, so who needs the man card? You have the race card and the ableism card. Don't look now. But well, we've got gnomes. <laughs> Why are you having a festival about men? What about the, the gnomes? 
And what the hell's wrong with your mouth? I wasn't taught how to be a man. I don't know whether you can be taught how to be a man. Yes, uh, quite a lot of people said that. It's a bit of a weird name for a festival that you would go to. <laughs> is, it, is, is, is it good form to go to the Women of the World Festival and say, I don't think women can be of the world? <laughs> I mean, you'd get such a loud and violent backlash, you wouldn't have the time or opportunity to contradict yourself like you do here. They're the biggest part of... Being a man, I suppose, is being able to talk about what your problems are. There we go. It's not guns, it's not bitches, it's not bling. It's being able to talk about your feelings. But it's not something you can learn. That's why we're teaching it to people at a festival. I think only when I became a man myself and I had my first son. The plot marinades. <laughs> You become a real man when you spawn. Interesting. Okay, uh, again, do not say that to women. <laughs> if you go on record, record telling any amount of women, even implying to them that they're only real women if they can have children, it will. your career will be in the toilet quicker than you can throw up in it. You, you do know that. Good. Just checking. You're, you're not just throwing caution into the wind here. You're fully down with the double thing. All right, show us what you can do. But my dad wasn't in my life. A lot of the times that I would see my dad, he'd be drunk, but my dad wasn't in my life. When he comes around, he takes you out or whatever. My dad ducked down in the back, son, and he kind of pushed my head down behind the seat in my life. My dad came, basically I was filming in my life, and he didn't bring my son back for two days. Um, and after that, I told him that I don't ever want to speak to him again, and I don't want him around in my life, but my dad wasn't in my life. Whatever happened, you know, it's a complex um, relationship that I had with him. Uh-huh. Your dad was in your life, Ashley. You just described it in some detail, how he was in your life, and he was even ready and willing to help you raise your children, until you decided to eject him from your life. And yet you introduced this story by saying, my dad wasn't in my life, even though it's patently untrue. It's... it's a, is that just something people people are expected to say in your community? Is it like a badge of honour to be able to say, I didn't have no dad? It's like having an ASBO. Like, yeah. Even if you did have a dad and he loved you and wanted to be with you, you still have to pretend he was never in your life because that gives you more street cred. See, I think this might be an unhelpful and damaging lie you're being perhaps socially coerced into telling yourself. And I thought I pointed out, since Jude is mysteriously neglecting to, I mean, it's just, on, the, on the contrary, I think this is why you're the first speaker. She wanted you to tell the story of how your dad was an asshole and you don't have no dad, but you still went on to sire seven children. That is, the, that is a success story of the modern family as far as feminists are concerned. No fathers, no betas, just a village full of single mothers and their immaculate conceptions. The harshest lie in common parlance today is I have no son. The next harshest is I didn't have a dad. Needless to say, the lies I have no daughter and I didn't have a mother are not in common parlance. Is this what patriarchy looks like when you're swimming in it, Jude? Denzel said to him, do the movie, but whatever you do, don't kiss anyone or don't do the sexual scenes and stuff like that because the black community will never forgive you for it. This is a recurring theme at, at the BAM festival. Uh, apparently the black community is very homophobic and nobody can think of a solution other than smash the white supremacist patriarchy. And when I went to do this scene, I, my, my, the natural thing for me to do was to, you know, I tried to put my tongue in the guy's mouth <laughs> and he went, cut, <laughs> cut. And the best way to smash the white supremacist patriarchy is to make interracial gay cinema. <laughs> I think these are the two stories you were brought on to tell, Asha. The fact of the matter is, um, I've got a lot of respect for it. I've got a lot more work for it. Um, people believe in me more as an actor. I've been taken more seriously yeah. about, about what I do. Um, and my peers respect me more. Your peers? That's mostly actors now, isn't it? 
and the backlash that I expected to get from, you know, my community, the black community, um, wasn't half as bad as I thought it would be. If a straight guy portrays a gay guy, actually, that's a sort of solidarity in a way. Yeah, I mean, they, yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> and so, black community, the moral of the story is this resentful aversion you have to homosexuality, you need to free yourselves of it by diving headfirst into gay. When you surface, you will receive fame and riches beyond your wildest dreams. But but this this resentful aversion you have to your fathers, keep up the good work. It's doing wonders for your complexion. All right, I'm done with you, Asher. You're, you're very confused indeed. And yes, I am disrespecting you. <laughs> All right, back to the floor. We're outside the green side. We, we were outside the blue side before. We were, there were no gnomes here. I think we're okay. <laughs> there's, there's three different things that are on at the same time now. Eternity bait, the bait, I belong there, and boys and care. Uh, boys and care, can you? Uh, I can't actually find two. It's an hour-long play about being a, a Syrian immigrant in the UK, which, re which is related to being a man. Unless you're trying to get sympathy for Syrian immigrants, in which case they're all women and children. <laughs> and not from Afghanistan. And I can't actually find where that's even being put on, so I'm going to go to Which is, as you've you probably heard, Men, now that men have the option of paternity leave and, per and shared parental leave, only 4% of them are actually taking it. Gender pay gap, gender pay gap, gender pay gap. They've amassed a bunch of people who've written books about toxic masculinity to try and answer that question. So, uh, I'm going to go watch that. Uh, although my father was obviously present, but uh, he, the, the fact that he wasn't there as much as, uh, as, much as my mum obviously meant that I kind of, uh, my mum took kind of, uh, I guess, centre place. And, yeah. and uh, how did you feel about your dad at the time? Can you remember your sort of, you know, your sense of emotional connection, the uh, the presence that he had in that, his, in your life? I don't think that is such a thing as being a man. And how that has influenced potentially uh, the sort of father that you are yourself now? I guess uh, it's not just to do with my own experience. I guess um, today, that I'm men today, dads today are more present than their dads were, um, I think generally and probably than their dads' dads were in that case because society is, is changing that way. Um, but I guess personally I would I would defer to um, my mum because so she did you know she was at home a bit the whole time so she didn't work um, and she was the, the the main parent in the in the, in the, in the 1970s when I grew up. So, so yeah. yeah. I've, got, I've got to show this before I forget. Look at this. How to be a superman. <laughs> we've brought Nietzsche to the people. Specifically, we've brought, brought Nietzsche to seven-year-old boys. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it's, uh, it's a sculpture. I think it. I think it's a sculpture. It's. I don't. I, 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 <laughs> and it's supposed to sing, starring Martin Kemp. It's. I don't. I. I just. I just don't. <laughs> Here we go, it makes sense now. It's a mod modified social bench. <laughs> the modified bench is transformed this around into places of activity rather than rest and solitude. You even fucking called it a social bench. We can't get a fucking rest because there's nothing to sit on but your goddamn social benches. The, I, you see what I mean? This is some bullshit. This is everything that's wrong in the world. I know you need to sit down. I know, I, I know, I know you need to take the weight off your feet from a long day of work. But it's not as important as our weird ass fucking projects because this means something. Uh. Once again, we've got two things on at the same time: boys don't cry and bad education. 
and you can imagine exactly what all this shit is about in the other one in the in the big room with the echo yeah sorry about that fuck you <laughs> sound quality is not as important as uh, as me and, and my anxieties <laughs> let's go and watch boys don't cry so i'm really delighted to have uh, such an expressive and interesting uh, panel with me today yes hello I'm delighted to be here. I'll be breaking up the sections of panel discussions as much as possible. I'm afraid the flailing, delirious weathercock we got to hold the camera was unavail unavailable for comment. Believe it or not, he was concentrating on not shaking the camera. If you're emotionally expressive, you're not going to get very far. Right. And people are going to bully you, people are going to take the mick out of you. Uh, it's good that you're thinking, but you've got the causality a little bit twisted up there. People don't bully you just for being self-expressive. They bully you for whatever psychological reason they can. And if you express yourself, if you express your psyche, they will find that reason. They will find your Achilles heel. It's not that you're expressing, it's what you're expressing. And you're getting it, you're getting it sort of backwards. It's, it's as though you're looking at poker players, the poker players playing poker and telling them, why must you be so stoic? <laughs> Why must you punish each other for the slightest facial expression? No wonder you all look so miserable. Yes, no, they're not doing it to themselves because of some weird ego disease. They're doing it because it is made necessary by the rules of poker. The more you express, the more vulnerable you are in that system. I've got to say, the, the first question on my mind is not, why do men wear this mask of stoicism? It's... How and why did men get trapped in a never-ending poker game? Perhaps we could comparatively examine the people who are not trapped in the never-ending poker game. I think the guard goes on a little bit when there are uh, women present. I think when it's just men, there's this kind of competitive, like, vying to be the top dog kind of atmosphere. Uh, you... You think men are less competitive in the presence of women? Do you for real, real think? <laughs> like, if you have a cage full of male humans, you will make them less competitive if you throw in some female humans. <laughs> that would make them fairly unique among mammals. It would make them, make them fairly unique among terrestrial vertebrates. Is, is this what you think? And if so, why in all hallows' ass do you think it? For me, I went to a large school. Okay, then how? Wow. If you grow up as a as a guy, you're not really you don't have to think about gender. It's kind of a lot of the time it's thought of women. They're the ones who have the gender, and men are just it's you know that's neutral. It's like default setting. Exactly, which is you know problematic in itself. <laughs> yes, I, although I I can't know what you mean by problematic. Uh, yes, women have a gender, men effectively do not. Women have an identity, men do not. Men have to work hard to be called a real man. Women are simply bestowed real womanhood just for being women. Be they rich or poor, weak or strong, beautiful or otherwise. Could you describe for me in what ways this is problematic? And don't forget, the light is being refracted and turbulently distorted by the patriarchy in which we're all swimming. So, remember to recalibrate a few, a few degrees up before you fire the torpedoes. Ready, aim. Because it oppresses women, <laughs> that's right. It's so easy when you think about it in just the right way. Women get to dress and act like the ruling classes of any given historical period, be it Renaissance aristocracy or Egyptian pharaohs or newborn royal babies. While men of all classes all over the world aren't even allowed to answer a phone unless they're dressed like undertakers. If the genders were reversed, or, you know, swapped for any other two groups of people, there would be no doubt in your mind which is the oppressed class. But let us never forget the predetermined conclusion. We're all swimming in patriarchy. That means society is set up to benefit men at the expense of women. So you see, men have the privilege of being society's indistinguishable pallbearers. And women face the systemic institutional oppression of being whatever they feel like. Hey guys, what you know, what if we're not all swimming in patriarchy? 
Well, what if there's not this elusive and untraceable force out there that no one is responsible for creating, but everyone is responsible for fixing? What if this unfalsifiable conspiracy theory of yours is not true? Yeah, the red pill is not a conspiracy theory. The red pill is the moment you realize all the conspiracy theories are false. And the world is rudderless. Yeah, um, actually I watched a YouTube uh, video before I came here. <laughs> yeah, is that an endorsement? <laughs> they, they, they didn't mention the internet much at BAM, except to endorse their own websites, of course. <laughs> The, the strange thing is, I think fewer people attended this festival than are subscribed to me on, on YouTube. And, and, and that might make it seem like we have them outnumbered, but you, know, you, you, guys, you guys are like a, few, a few dots in a few hovels scattered all the way across the planet. The, the BAM festival is geographically limited. And to an area of you know, rich, opulent people who enjoy pastimes such as crowds and identity politics. So <laughs> it's it's basically like you know digging up a chunk of London soil and counting the earthworms and shit. And this chunk of the South Bank contains a thousand hypnotized retards for every one sane person. <laughs> and uh, and you know, these are people who still get their information from the mainstream media. They've trusted it their whole lives. They still think the BBC and The Guardian are unbiased and centrist. <laughs> oh. And, and see, there's sort of an age divide among these folks because there's so many of them. The older generation tends to think social media is part of the problem, while the younger generation thinks it's part of the solution. <laughs> But they're all at least agreed that you shouldn't direct too much attention to YouTube because YouTube is full of those unspeakable, heretical, patriarchy deniers. Totally. I think, um, especially with, like, pop culture, there was, like, kind of a big thing with uh, Will Smith's son, Jaden Smith, wearing a dress. And everyone's like, why is he wearing a dress? Who cares? Really, who cares? Wise words. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah, if the son of a movie star could get away with it, then why can't I? Oh, that's right. I'm busy selling crack and I need pockets. Why? Why is that such an issue? You know, he is loved. And that's what I think um, a lot of men are running away from is love. You know... If the stereotypes are to be believed, then black men's problem is they run away from their children, while white men's problem is they're not allowed to see their children. <laughs> Maybe black men are just watching what happens to white men and going, nope, I'm cutting my losses now before I get emotionally involved. I don't want to end up broke and suicidal like those poor white bastards who actually love their kids. There's no panel discussion about that, by the way. There's no lectures about divorce. Nothing about the lives ruined by the ideologically biased decisions of family courts, let alone any attempt to frame it as a crisis of white families. But you've got plenty of black men telling other black men not to abandon their children like I'm proud of my dad abandoning me like my mum said he did. All right? <laughs> or maybe the stereotype's not true. Maybe black men, just like white men, do want to see their children. They do want to give them love and attention. Unfortunately, the only women they are able to impregnate are women who would rather raise children on their own. Or have already moved on to someone else. Like the state. I have, I have a suggestion for your next festival. A brief talk or discussion entitled Hypergamy. What is it and how can it affect people's lives? If, if you find the very concept of female hypergamy to be so non-existent as to offend you with the mere invocation of it, then I would invite you to weigh it against the very concept of patriarchy. If patriarchy is an unquestioned given and hypergamy is blasphemous to even mention, 
then perhaps you're not quite as egalitarian and wide open to controversial or offensive subjects as you say you are. Bam. Self-love, especially. And um, I'm just talking from also experience, you know. Um, I've learned through my dancing to learn to purge, learn to put all of this kind of energy, this lost energy, into something through me crying. Okay, so to you, crying is a bit like throwing up. It's something you do on purpose to purge yourself. What? Fuck it, man. He's to their own, I suppose. But I don't know. To me, I'd say crying is more like sweating. Your your skin sweats when your body is under stress. And your eyes cry when your mind is under stress. And the only way to sweat less is to endure the stress. Train yourself. The first time you skin your knee... You, you might well cry, but the second time you'll just go, ah! ah! And so on and so forth. And by the third and fourth time, your lip will barely tremble. <laughs> Exercise. If you're physically healthy, you can climb a staircase without breaking into a sweat afterwards. And if you're psychologically healthy, you could do it without crying about it beforehand. But as I said, each to their own. If you'd rather binge on mental junk food and then barf it out your eye sockets, then what else? I'm sure that works too. I can't... Oh, God, I have to move on to someone else, dude. Here's everyone's problem so far. When a crying child says, I want my mummy, you find their mummy. When a crying child says, I want my teddy bear, you give them their teddy bear. And when a crying child says, I want candy, you might even consider giving them a candy. But when a crying child says, I want my daddy, you lean down into his little face and say, you're not crying enough. And then you fuck off and leave him crying. And then you wonder why he stops crying forever and pretends he never had a dad. Do you think there is a different pressure on the younger generation when it, when it comes to emotions? And do you see that changing at all? Well, I wrote that show with my nan, so we made it together. So the, the idea was to make a comedy show about me losing my dad at 15 and her losing a son at 18. I think this is why a lot of boys turn to drugs, because it's at least better than getting addicted to amateur dramatics. So my dad died when I was 15 in the middle of my GCSEs. He was diagnosed with cancer 10 days before he died. So it's incredibly sudden and a very sort of weird whirlwind to be in. Yes, for you, crying is more important than trying to get your dad back because you can't get your dad back. But that puts you in something of a minority, especially compared with the people who don't have their dads because their mothers won't let them have their dads. Sorry if I end up hammering on this point once too often, but this... Boys Don't Cry seminar would be well accompanied by some kind of dads don't get custody discussion. And I, yeah, I'm not, it's, not, it's nowhere to be found, I'm afraid. That, you know, it was a really odd adjustment period to go back and suddenly go from being a sort of Jack, quiet, slightly overweight, does a bit of drama, to being like Jack, the boy whose dad died. And that was a very kind of visceral experience. And you may not be able to get your dad back but if you want to prevent other dads from dying then in your case cancer research is what we need anything you can do to raise awareness of the kinds of cancers that dads get this one's for the all clearers it's for the skies Going back to the disabled toilet in the sixth form block where if I felt really sad at school I would go to cry. And the reason I would was because it was somewhere completely separate. There was, you know, nobody really used the disabled toilet. It was a sort of like thing that was there and I just used to hide there. Me too. I still do. It's, it's this problem I have with socialising. 
like even if it's at the pub with friends or something i'll often find none of my thoughts are worth articulating so i don't speak to anyone before i know it i've gone like an hour and a half without speaking to anyone and i've started to wonder what's the point of me and it'd be rude to leave uh, but it'd also be rude to stay looking like a rather miserable and ungrateful eyesore on an otherwise jovial event so i i go to the toilet cubicle and and i find myself crying for what is essentially no reason And though you know, crying for no reason is not exactly a picnic, it's not as bad, in my opinion, as crying for a reason. Having a reason to cry. The strange moments of anxious melancholy I experience are generally over after a couple of hours. I am left only to imagine what it's like to cry for a reason that never goes away. Like the loss of a child, or the loss of a parent. <clears throat> And as much as I appreciate whatever sympathy I may have anecdotally swirled in my direction in making this point, I would ask that you cast that sympathy in the direction of those who need it. The people who have lost a child, or a parent, and can still get them back. Or the people who might lose a child or a parent, but through some accumulation of emergent actions, including your own, will be spared that experience. Prevention is better than the cure. I'm going to keep saying this. Thank you very much for the plasters and the bandages and the stitches and the ointments. Can we please do something about the Wolverine? Um, so really, it's about, it's about dialogue and getting this conversation started here and out the world. Good, good. You don't mind me broadcasting this footage then? No problems with that, because it'd be pretty shitting duplicitous if you did. So thanks for listening so intently. Thank you. For fuck's sake. Not only are they fucky eyesores of neon orange, but as you can see, they're here for the sake of the children. Won't somebody think of the children? It's like when you look at any park, any uh, just 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 park near your house. They, it, it'll have a slide, it'll have a swing set, it'll have a jungle gym somewhere, and it'll have one bench for the old people to sit on. And the arty farty people looked at that and went, no, we should change the bench into yet another piece of children's apparatus. Because fuck the old people. Up next in the Sunley Pavilion, why are so many Muslim men in prison? I mean, it's not terrorism. So what the hell's happening? It's not as if it's other crimes. You know, I'm really tempted to simply go down there and listen to what these men have to say. Unfortunately, it's all at the same time as the one about male suicide, and that is, that's the one I'm going to have to watch. I have to know what the establishment excuse is for this shit. A statistic that um, we uh, that never gets any less shocking is that suicide is the single bi biggest killer of men under the age of 45. Men account for 75% of all suicides. You know, I, I don't find the statistic itself quite as shocking as what I hear when I listen to the people who've been tasked with addressing this problem. Because by and large, their approach to all these suicidal men is if you're gay, come out. If you're black, have more children. And if you're straight and white, then lighten the fuck up and pull yourself together. You own the world. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping the following talk will be an exception and not more of the same rigid moral hierarchy of identity politics that got us here in the first place. And when all I have left is hope, that's not usually a good sign. Even as a little boy, I was quite different. I, was, I used to cry a lot, I was very sensitive. And that was all right when I was a little boy. But then there reached a certain point. You know, people used to say to me, okay, you got, you're a big boy now, you know, stop crying. You mean adults aren't supposed to cry as much as children? Yes, that is, <laughs> that is the nature of such, of such a crossover in a social species such as this. Or any, again, this is biologically normal unless you're some kind of marsupial. 
I'm all in favour of, of men expressing themselves and expressing the source of their problems. But could you not find someone less fatuous than Mr. I can't handle being a placental mammal? Jesus, it keeps coming down to this. Men are expected at some point in their lives to grow up and take care of themselves. And women are not. <laughs> women are encouraged for their entire adult lives to keep acting like children and cry victim when you don't get what you want. And all these people are looking at that situation, thinking, how do we make this equal? And the only solution they can think of is we have to treat men like children as well. This is how the idiocracy happens. We're going to infantilize and emotionally lobotomize every living citizen because we were all too polite to say maybe the women should change. If young boys feel the need to act like adults, while adult women feel the need to act like children, then why don't women grow the fuck up? Why is it always men need to break the fuck down? It's never women need to grow the fuck up. You cannot ask that question. By that, I mean you will not get an answer to that question. You will get insulted and misrepresented and slandered and ostracized for even asking that question. Because it has already been answered by the foregone conclusion in which we are all swimming, need I remind you. Patriarchy is all around us. That means society is created for men's benefit at the expense of women. That means men need to sacrifice for women and not the other way around. Women need more human rights. Women need more opportunities, more children, and more free stuff. And men need to give it to them and stop petulantly crying about all this power you're losing to women. And then come to our man festival and learn how to cry. And express vulnerability. But you can only cry and express vulnerability regarding the approved and regulated topics, which are your father, the boys in your school, and how much misogyny there is in the world. And I was always a bit different. Um... I was, like Johnny said, I was a bit more, more of a sensitive kid. So far, the male suicide talk is exactly the same as the boys don't cry talk. Except it's mostly, probably straight men. And boys don't cry was mostly, probably gay men. Which is a weird way around, since gay men do more than their fair share of the crying and the suiciding. Started to... to cry a lot. I used to take myself into the cubicles at work and, and cry and not really understand why I was crying. Small world, isn't it? <laughs> Fancy seeing you here as well. I, just, I, you know, I wonder how many men there are up and down the country right now crying in a toilet cubicle as quietly as possible. Maybe we need a name for this peculiar gendered phenomenon. It's like a man anxiety attack or a manic attack oh it was already a thing in these issues that I was having I basically just um, drowned them in alcohol and drugs and partying and being a trying to be a lad Surgeon General's warning lad is not to be taken with any drugs alcohol or antibiotics lad is not suitable for pregnant women Lad Pharmaceuticals is not responsible. Please consult your local GP. And very much like yourself, I kind of created this faux masculinity of going out and getting drunk and doing what I thought men my age did. Fuck's sake, you can't just be drunk, can you? You can't just be enjoying yourself like women do. When women go out together and get all shit-faced and girly and loud, they're being free spirits and living life to the fullest and girl power and shit. But when you get drunk and have a good time with your friends, you're not manning properly. <sighs> when women do it, they become intoxicated. When men do it, they become toxic. Men and women fail in exactly the same way. But only men translate that failure as a failure to live up to an ideal of their gender. Quite right, David. Well, these two mofos just did it again. So you and I have to be here to remind everyone once again that if toxic femininity is not a thing, then neither is toxic masculinity. Because toxic masculinity is a ruddy good example of seeing your failings as gendered failings. And you might want to avoid that kind of black and white ideological thinking if you don't want to come across as a man-hater. And, you know, dear men, if you drink, take drugs, or have fun with your friends, it doesn't necessarily mean you're, a, you're secretly manically depressed. And you're just being a faux man. What the fuck? 
It's very possible that all you're doing there is having a healthy amount of fun. Don't listen to the moral busybodies who call you a sissy for playing with dolls. And don't listen to the moral busy busybodies who call you a lad for playing with alcohol. It's clear at this point that the people at BAM Festival have no principles. They just have a list of unacceptable slurs like pussy and sissy and faggot. And on the other hand, they have a list of acceptable slurs like lad and macho and misogynist. Because to them, it's perfectly okay for, to, for a boy to sit alone in his room trying to be more like a girl. But it is strictly verboten for a young man to communicate, let alone commune with other young men in the outside world. Because that's lad culture, and it leads to rape culture. Do you people seriously believe you are improving men's mental health? I think it's very rare for men to be able to sit down the pub and go, oh, do you know what, I've been feeling really depressed and dejected and I've had a couple of issues I need to talk about. They don't, they talk about the football or women or or whatever they want to talk about. It's not a subject that we brought up in normal conversation amongst men. So men don't talk about the issues they're having in their lives. They talk about inconsequential things like women. <laughs> Do you have any iceberg tip of a clue what you've done wrong there? Or is this a persistent blockage with you? When you're, when you're, when you're down the pub and your mate Barry is like, my wife kicked me out, Aaron. The divorce went through. She's got the house, the car, both the kids, and she's uh, she's been fucking the next door neighbour for the past six years. And all you can say is, why don't you tell me about your problems, Barry? All you ever talk about is women. Whilst I found on Twitter that people are a lot more willing to be open. You see what I tell you? Social media. So, some of them are for it, some of them are against it, but none of them know how it works. Sir, please don't tell anyone that people on Twitter are more willing to be open. <laughs> it is untrue. It is very badly untrue, sir. Twitter will improve no one's mental health. It is a hellish menagerie of Dr. Jekyll experiments telling you to kill yourself. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Next pundit thing. Oh. And it took a long time in my head to realise that the reason that people didn't want to talk about it is because... Real men, obviously, are invulnerable. To women. Men as a group are eternally and unquestionably invulnerable to women as a group, according to patriarchy theory. And should be invulnerable. To women. And if they're not, then they're not a real man. Heart of the problem. Dead centre of the heart of the problem. You are not a real man if you don't believe in the patriarchy. We can only really talk about it if they were under 18. Yeah, and they hate their dad. Or if they had some other additional thing about them. Like being black or gay. That made them OK for funders or for the media to talk about. We've got a long way to go, haven't we? And, and what we've seen in the last five years, particularly in the last two years, rapidly, is quite a big cultural change. And, and lots and lots of discussion around gender and men and suicide, and that's been brilliant. Oh, really? Well, well, I'm here to celebrate what the dialogue on male suicide could be if we give it time, space, and permission to expand its boundaries, so to speak. I think it would be more brilliant if we give men the time, space, and permission to blame their problems on something other than their fathers and their friends. I would let them perhaps talk about the abuse they received from their mothers, their teachers, their girlfriends, their wives, and of course the state, on the behest of all of the above. I'd give men the opportunity to talk about the laws they'd like to change, so that they might enjoy the same human rights to which women are privileged, such as the right to have children and the right not to have children. I think we might get fewer men killing themselves, if we put the navel gazing aside for a moment and work on giving equal reproductive rights to men. But that's another one of those questions that won't get an answer, because it's a question that's made invalid by the all permeating invisible superfluid of patriarchy, in which most of us are floating face down at the moment. Yes, the airheaded identitarian hypotheses you give crazy people billions of dollars to come up with, not helping.
when it comes to men's suicide. Definitely not helping. On the contrary, watch me while I insinuate that it is causing this. Alright, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done for the day. For the, uh, for the theoretical narrative day. And I'm I, as, as exhausted now as I was on the scene. So I'll, I'll leave you there. I'll pick it up on, on, the, on, on the next imaginary narrative day. Ole! I mean, it looks ominous, doesn't it? It's the slow creep of ominousness. This is... I mean, it starts with the sites of arts festivals, but this is what the world's going to look like in 15 years, I swear to God. Benches you can't sit on. And, it, and gnome sentinels on every corner, making sure you don't oppress the gnomes or something. I don't know why I... Uh...